<laughs> oh, oh, we're live right yeah, now. We're live right okay, now. cool. Where are the cameras at? Where, where am I looking? No, it's right there. Camera's right there. Okay, there it's, we go. Yeah, you're good, though. Just look at me. You're good, man. Nice. So, Pierre. Yes, Pierre. Glad it's me. It's me, the the real estate agent, the realtor, apartment locator, really whatever you want to call me. The, the guru. <laughs> yeah, I go by a lot of titles. <laughs> so let's let's take it from the beginning, man. Sure. Where'd you grow up at? Uh, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. So. Oh. That's where I grew up. Uh, my family, they're lower, lower middle class, right? So like, mm -hmm. thank God I wasn't raised in the hood. Right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that I do appreciate, but uh, my family never really made a lot of money. So it was kind of up to myself after high school to kind of figure it out, right? right. So, you know, graduated high school, parents were like, well, we don't really have a lot of money for college. So you, you gotta figure it out yourself. Um, so, you know, I started working jobs ever since I was 16, I started, as in the food industry, right? Okay. Pretty typical story, right? Bus boy, I was promoted to be a waiter. Okay. Um, and then I wanted something a, a bit more professional, right, than the food industry. So I started working for Bank of America. I was a bank teller. That was unbelievably corporate and just <laughs> nuts. Yeah, so then they finally promoted me to be a personal banker. Mm -hmm. And it was a little better. Um, you had to be super professional, you had to wear a suit very very corporate and it didn't still didn't really pay a lot right and there was not a lot of uh things you could do outside of your job title per se right you know you just kind of do a select few tasks over and over and over again so i got bored very very quickly um and at the time I actually put in my two weeks right i was i was looking for just absolutely anything to do um to not like be an employee and work mm -hmm. for someone else. So it's kind of embarrassing, but the first business plan I put together was uh, I was going to sell mayonnaise at the local farmer's market. Well, that <laughs> it was all I knew how to do. I mean, I was, I was uh, 18 years old mm -hmm. and th that was like the only idea. I just had this thing about making like organic mayo from scratch. Yeah. It was just my thing, you know, and I would have different flavors. So I constructed a whole business plan over four different flavors of mayo yeah. and I was gonna I had already contacted like the manager at the local farmers market <laughs> and I had this whole business plan laid out yeah. um, and I remember telling my mom I was like I don't care how much this is gonna make I just can't really work for someone else so I was I was gonna go all in in this mayo selling business idea <laughs> I had as an 18 year old right um, and I had a buddy uh, that came in, it, this was in Austin, Texas. Okay. So in one of the few cities where apartment locating was, was starting to really trend and pick up mm -hmm. and be hot, right? Cause that's, that's the real estate niche that I specialize in is apartment locating. So my buddy came in, you know, it was like 19 years old and he was paying off his brand new, at the time it was like a brand new Acura TL. And so I was the, the personal banker. I was doing the, the transaction, paying off his car. And I was like, dude, your parents got you a dope car, man. You're paying it off. And he's like, no, 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 I paid this off myself. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, what do you do at 19? And he's like, well, I do this weird niche called uh, apartment locating. You have to have a real estate license. So I was like, interesting. So I looked into it and I was like, this is gonna be my plan B, like in case my Mayo business falls <laughs> apart. Right. I was like, I'll, I'll just do this apartment locating real estate niche, right? Mm -hmm. So when I first started off, um, I worked with a local broker and they were very, very traditional in, in the sense that they didn't really know what apartment locating was, mm -hmm. but I had, I already had a real estate license at the time. So I worked for this, this big traditional brokerage firm to try to be like a realtor at first, even though I knew about the locating industry. Mm -hmm. And for 45 days, I tried to do everything my broker told me to do, right? Just do cold calls, door knock. Um, and that was kind of it other than just waiting around and, and, and getting uh, free leads from your broker. Sure. So I tried that and I did so bad, man. Like if I, yeah. I, I was a really bad realtor. Why do, like, you think, why do you think you were bad at being a realtor? Well, I guess when I, coming from like a personal banker, I was very, very, um, you know, like textbook grade, trying to do a job exactly how it's supposed to be done. And that doesn't really work in real estate. Like you gotta really show your personality and learn how to connect with people uh, because you're no longer an employee, right? right? So people, you have to connect with them in a real sense. And that was really hard for me, especially on random cold calls. Right. So I didn't do very well as a realtor at all. It took me a while to kind of get out of that like corporate shell that I was so used to. 
Um, and I guess I was just bad at cold calls in general, you know, just mm-hmm. bugging people at random times, trying to be their realtor. Right. And every every realtor almost does the same thing, especially seven years ago sure. when I first started this. So um, I started doing open houses. That was like the, the new thing that would work to get like buyer leads at the time because my cold calling didn't work. The door knocking didn't work. And my broker wasn't providing a lot of quality leads. So I was like, I'll just do open houses, I guess. And I did open houses for two weeks and it didn't really go well. So I got so desperate that I actually rented a Porsche for a couple of, like just for a couple of days to park yeah. it like in front of the open house. Yeah. Just to just show like the illusion that I was successful. Right. And, and it kind of worked. I, I got two appointments. Final, my first two wow. appointments when I parked that Porsche in front of the open house. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it worked and I started working with these people that were looking to purchase a house Mm -hmm. and, um, I worked with them for like, it must've been like 30 days where I was, Mm -hmm. did the pre-call. We, I, you know, showed them a bunch of houses over and over and over again. And then like, they're only free on the weekend Mm -hmm. typically. So it was like weeks after weeks of working with the same client. And we finally picked out a house that they were going to put an offer in. And when it was time to do that and start the negotiations, they actually started working with a credit repair company wow. and just backed out of the whole deal. And they were like, well, we want to get the, my, our credit score higher mm-hmm. so we can lock down a better mortgage rate. Right. So it's like you, I couldn't even convince them, you know, because it was such a sensible you know, thing that they right. were trying to do is just, I couldn't even convince them to go ahead and continue with the purchase. So I had just wasted four weeks. Yeah. I just least. wasted four weeks uh-huh. and it was, it was really depressing because I quit my job as a personal banker. And I, I remember just, it was just a dark time, man. Like when I got that phone call, I felt like throwing up. It was so weird. I like stormed out of my office, almost threw up, had these weird cold sweats. And um, I was like, dang it, I'm not going to be a good realtor or a real estate agent at all. I just quit my job like it was bad. Yeah. Um, and so so that's when I that's when I was driving around. I drove around uh, uh, right after that day of work. I was heading home and I looked over and I saw this like apartment locating. It was a weird one story house mm-hmm. and it was converted into an apartment locating office. Okay. And I remember I was like, oh, my buddy told me about locating or something. Mm-hmm. So I knew it existed. And so I walked in there and I talked to the, the, the lady that owned this, uh, this older one story house that was converted. And she was telling me how her agents, she had 12 agents at the time. And she was telling me how, um, they all earned like her top producers earned six figures. And I was like, well, what exactly really is apartment locating? And so she explained to me like, well, you have to be a licensed real estate agent, which I was. And she's like, you just help everyday people rent an apartment for free. And then these apartment buildings just pay you one month out of their 12 month contract. And I was like, well, that sounds like it's only a grand or two. But then the trick is that I swear everyone just overlooks is how often people rent apartments. It's the frequency. That's the big golden nugget. It's not really the payouts because they're not big, but you could, you could do two, three or four um, as long as you have your marketing up in a single day. And so that translates into thousands of dollars. Um, and so that's how it, it started. She, I, I started like the day after I spoke with her and on my first weekend, I closed, uh, three people that needed an apartment. Um, and it was a total of like just under $4,000 on a weekend. And I, I had finally like made money in real estate. Finally three times. So I I went from like 45 days to almost two months of like trying really hard, working full time as a realtor to not close anything. And then the first week I started, like my first closing was three closings (laughs) and, and, um, it just took off from there. And I was, I was impressed on how quick the turnaround time was and how fast everything happened. So, um, just started doing the same thing over and over again for, for years, you know? So, okay. And then, so you've been doing it seven years now. Yeah. Okay. Then <laughs> yeah. The first deal you did, how fast, how long did it take you to get paid out on that? So, um, that is dependent on how I find that in my, in my industry, the, we call the apartments based on the quality and the age classes. So it'll range from like class C, class B and class A. So luckily for me, it seems like the class A properties pay very fast. If you, if you close someone, the time that you have to wait in order to get paid starts when your tenant, your client moves in. 
And with class A properties, you can get paid as fast as two weeks to four weeks. Okay. So when I when I when I helped three people find an apartment, they were all class A's and they paid me like less than 30 days after they moved in. Okay. So, you know, the clo the process is super easy. Like from when you meet someone, um, you can help them apply the same day, right. but then you wait until they move in. You know, so some people move in next week, in a month. It all just depends on their move-in date. And wh what exactly is the classification for a Class A property? Yeah, it's different in every market, but typically, like in Austin, it's very straightforward. You can almost look at the year built and just kind of tell what class it is. But the class just means uh, the quality of amenities offered, uh, the standard of their appliances, like, you know, usually with class A, you'll see nice stainless steel, newer appliances, usually wood floors instead of carpet throughout. And then just the property itself is newer, you know, 2014 or newer. That's what a class A is. Class B is like 07, you know, built. Um, it's not bad, like they still might do wood, there might be black appliances right. in there. And then class C is just like run down, like right. built in the seventies. Right. They're not investing in vinyl. It's all carpet every right. time. <laughs> so that's sort of the class, but it does, it does change per market. So okay. like a class A in Austin mm -hmm. might be a class B in some areas of California. Okay. So, you know, it's all relative. There's no like textbook grade really on anything with real estate, which is why I like the industry. The, there's no black and white. Everything's up for negotiation. Even all the terms we use is just relative to someone's market. So there's a lot of, it's just a very broad industry, which could be fun. You so know? I know you brought up marketing before. Mm -hmm. How much you say you roughly spend on marketing uh, monthly? Uh, as an apartment locator, because I have a couple different businesses, as an apartment locator, I would do about five or six thousand dollars in ad spend. But I focus only on on two platforms mainly, and that's targeted Facebook ads and Google ads. Okay. Um, and I and those are the only two that um, I would use. And there's many ways to market. You know, you could do, you know, Instagram, which is essentially just Facebook ads, just in a different platform, LinkedIn. Now there's TikTok. There's all kinds of right. ways to market. But for me, Facebook and Google just seem to be like the best return on investment. So yeah, for a locator, you know, you're still in the four digits per month. Right. And, um, it's actually PPC, which is pay per click and paid ads, is actually very exciting. I would say for um, an apartment locator or a real estate agent, as opposed to other businesses, because um, the payouts are so big. So, so what I've noticed in the industry is that typically um, online businesses um, use a lot of digital marketing strategies like paid Facebook ads or Google. And you don't really see a lot of real estate professionals really taking advantage of digital marketing. And so, um, and it's a shame too, because, you know, these online businesses that, that, you know, started using digital marketing really first before other businesses, um, you know, they're, they're not selling incredibly, um, um, uh, big payout products. So for instance, like if you're selling, um, I don't know, some physical product for 50 bucks, you know, you might spend a certain amount on ads and you might get, you know, 30 bucks back. Right. And so you have to really, really fine tune and put a lot more effort in your paid marketing. If your payouts aren't that big, which is most of like a lot of online businesses, but as a real estate agent, you know, you could throw thousands of dollars into a campaign. And if you sell one house, that's 10 or 15 grand. Right. So okay. it, yeah, it gives you like the leeway to not even be so good at marketing and still get a return you know, because right. of the payout's so large. And then, so when did you actually start marketing? Because I know you've been doing this about seven years, right? Yeah. Do so you feel like the market has kind of got saturated a little bit since you've started in this business? Or is it just now, like, becoming a known thing now? So um, real estate in general, I think, is kind of saturated. Mm -hmm. The apartment locating niche is absolutely the opposite of, of saturated. So, um, you know, I make a lot of content is how you found me is right, through exactly. YouTube. Right. Um, and when I first started making content, you know, 
a smart thing to do as a content creator, as you know, since you make content, is you know we look up the volume and the traffic of, of the keywords right. that are associated in our, in our business so we can get a, an idea of um, how many views or, or, or activity we're, get, we're gonna get if we really start talking about this topic. So when I, did, when I started doing content, if you looked up the keyword traffic for apartment locating on like Google Trends or Google Keyword Planner, it was zero. So, which is rare, because you can almost type in anything on Google, cat, dog, <laughs> right. pet food, and like it's, you're gonna get some kind of activity. Right. So with apartment locating, it was goose egg. Really, so, seven, seven years ago. Uh, oh no, this is a couple, I'm sorry, this is a couple of years ago. Seven years ago, it was the same thing. Okay. So uh, nothing has changed. So there's, gotcha. there's like no traffic with people looking up apartment locating. So it tells you it's a very, very niche uh, business that's I think finally kind of starting to trend a little bit uh, but the data shows that it's clearly not saturated with apartment apartment locating okay yeah Do you feel like it's like just a big mostly the big firms that run apartment locating mostly not so much uh, individual agents like you know with normal real estate um, yeah, I mean, kind of, I think, um, and the thing is, there's not really a lot of big firms that do locating, like, there are clearly some leaders um, in the market that do the best. Um, but even they're local, like they're only in five, six cities right. in the around the United States. Um, so I wouldn't say there's like a big... I mean, they're all small to medium sized companies, even even the leaders. Mm -hmm. um, no one's really taken over the US, you know, like with like Keller Williams, like no one's at a Keller Williams level or Remax so in think, the industry. You think get to that level where someone has like, let's say the in every state almost blocked off. I mean, I'm, I'm working on it, you know? Okay. Yeah, so that's my <laughs> tactic. You know, I think that um, um, it's gonna start with putting content out and then really adding value first. That's what I try to do with my content. Because if you look at these, uh, the most successful apartment locating companies um, today, like none of them do digital marketing well at all. Like that's why you don't ever see paid Facebook ads or Instagram ads um, with with the apartment locating service. And every time I bring it up to people, they're like, what's apartment locating? Even realtors, they're like, what's apartment locating? Right. Um, you know, and so, so it, there are some winners and they're making millions, um, a year. I think, uh, what's the biggest, I think the biggest company might, might've hit like seven or 8 million, which is not as big as, you know, it's not like, like smart, it's like smart city. Uh, that's one of them. They're very big. Yeah. Yeah. I like what they're doing. I don't really agree with a lot of their business model, but they're clearly a winner and they're established. There's another one as well, um, that started in Austin. That's big too. Um, so, you know, yeah, th there, are, there are some winners, but not, no one's huge, right? you know, and no one's putting out content. Like, yeah, exactly. Well, they're not <laughs> well, like even with smart city. You don't even know, like most people don't even know probably who owns that company. Right. Unless you're in the industry, then you probably would look it up and find out. But most yeah. people who are looking for departments, they couldn't tell you like a Keller Williams, like this person's yeah. dominated this industry or like an Ebby holiday or anything like exactly. that. Exactly. You know? There's no real names like that. Exactly. It, which, and, and there's, and it's funny cause there's still like 10, you know, 10 million a year kind of flowing through these companies that right. don't even market well and it's little known and Google Trends is saying zero traffic keywords volume. So it's- do, do you think it's better to do like, I mean, cause your brand pretty much is you, right? Yeah. You're more yeah. like that kind of be that Keller Williams of apartment locating. Do you think it's better to go that route versus not being known at all, like publicly as an individual, but a company? What, do you, what route do you think would be better? Yeah, you know, and I'm still kind of determining that. Um, there's definitely ups and down uh, to, to do what I'm doing. Like I'm kind of the face and, and exactly. the, the, the brand. Um, I feel like the, it's a lower risk approach that way when um, you put out content, you know, essentially almost for free. Um, I mean, I have a team, I have an editor and a, and, and a writer, so nothing's really free at the end of the day, but um, I feel like the, the branding is less risk because um, it, when you put out content and then people see that, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about, um, they're much more um, warmed up to purchase from you exactly. and then you can kind of scale quicker um, when they know it's an actual, there's a, there's a, a, a personal a person. brand, mm -hmm. but I think, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, ha I don't have any eight, nine figure companies, so I'm sure things might be different um, when you really start scaling things up. So it, it might, it might work with, um, it might work better with a brand. Um, another thing too is that um, I know that it's, it's also tough to sell a personal brand company. 
Um, if you're ever, you know, have ideas to sell your company down like long, long term, it's harder to sell a personal brand because when you stop, you know, it's like it's hard to get valuation for, for companies like that. So I think I think it's it's uh, if you want to do a company, I think that's cool as well. Um, but I guess I'm just taking the personal brand approach first, okay. uh, less risk, uh, easier sales up front. Um, and then really it's just less risk. I think personal branding. And then yeah. I know you've been doing this for a number of years now, right? Being a realtor for a number of years. Uh -huh. Yeah. Why, if you, why have you not pursued being a broker? Yeah. So, um, I had ideas to become a broker. The big thing I see with, with, uh, brokers in my industry with apartment locating is a lot of them try to start with 10 or 20 agents before they really kind of fine tune their digital marketing. And so a lot of the students I get that, that purchase my program, they are brokers and the biggest, uh, uh, I guess weakness or thing they struggle with is how to scale because when you scale the number of agents under your firm, you have to be able to market and supply leads to everyone. And it becomes really hard when you start and kind of, and max yourself out with 10 or 20 agents where you're doing nothing but trying to service those agents. It's hard to scale your company. So, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of my colleagues are like, man, you've got a lot of followers and people want to work right. under you. You should start a brokerage firm. Right. Um, but I, I'm actually going to take a more conservative approach and, and kind of just continue to build a, a real audience. So that way, the day I decide to actually release a brokerage firm, now I have, you know, resources and sales from coaching right. program. So I can offer real support and resources um, inside of a brokerage firm and then start with less risk. Gotcha. So that's kind of what I, I do want to do, but I'm just going to continue building an audience and adding value first up, Cause, up front. Because what do you say? I mean, well, if you were to start a brokerage firm, how many agents would you start off with up under you? Uh, I would have to do uh, at least 100. But that's just my, that's my approach. Yeah, like if I can't do if I can't have 100 agents and support them well with marketing, I just. So you wouldn't start off with like 10. No, I think it's a huge mistake. And really? I see, and I see it. I see it happen. These brokers come to me. They come to me for support and they're like, help me run ads. And I'm like, well, you should have solved that problem before getting involved in a full time 10 agent brokerage firm where now you have overhead and um, I see that issue a lot that you know people just try to start a business with 10 or 20 agents and they never scale um, because they're so busy trying to support them um, and then then they're lacking the the capital or the resources to support them well where I think it's smarter if you would have just waited you know kept on growing your audience built some value you know you start when you're much more prepared as well right and like you said with the big farmers right they're doing like probably seven million you said in profit or revenue would you say uh revenue yeah it, it's in revenue but the thing is the profit margin is very high with in this industry with apartment locating well because you're just paying basically for ads yeah it's, it's like it's just like all ad paying. spend exactly because yeah. yeah. the service is free so you know mm -hmm. you help someone and it's just cash <laughs> you well, know there's no you know well, how do you make sure you get paid on each one so the, the, the number one determining factor is if someone uh, lists you on the rental application as their representation. Right. So, yeah, and it, legally it's if someone, um, um, you know, in writing um, is, is saying that they're working with a real estate agent as representation. I mean that no, there's nothing anyone else can say to sort of argue that. So as long as in writing, your clients are listing you as their like le legal real estate representation, you always get paid every time. It just, a lot of times clients forget to write the locator's name down. So a lot of that has to do with, um, having better follow-up sequences and really kind of almost to have a script on what to say so they don't forget. And what, so what is your follow-up sequence like so i use software for that um i used to just make an effort to remember to <laughs> tell them yeah. but that doesn't work very well <laughs> when, so, when you, you say software what do you mean by that uh so with a software i use like a crm that does a lot of my follow-up for me as well as some some things i teach so crm is like an automatic text and email um sequence so it's really cool and i work a lot with sales funnels instead of websites so i try to streamline my processes and my reminders so i i, I teach where like whenever i send over a list of properties to someone interested in 
a list of relevant apartments. I have an email attached on exactly how it works so they could read it. And then on top of that, I use a lot of selfie videos to where it's automated. Like I have a selfie video saved on my device and every time I get a lead, I like input, it's called short code snippets. So you, when you utilize short code snippets, you enter like one key and it pre-populates your, your, your text response, it like attaches the video. So every single time, you know, I use smart tactics to just like let these people know that, hey, like there's a face to the name, I'm, I'm a real gotcha. person. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when people see you, they feel like, all right, well, this guy's real, I'm not gonna ghost him. Right, exactly. You know, it's like, he just shot me a selfie video on FaceTime. So um, I use tactics like that, but I try to really automate them with um, with software. Software and digital marketing is the biggest secret that I try to share in okay. order to scale. And you use the sales funnel, like you said, sales funnels. Yeah, yeah, I work with sales funnels, which are just um, short, more optimized and efficient websites. So that's another thing, like most realtors don't even know what a sales funnel is. And everyone has this big traditional website that's very, very confusing. And it's hard to really just get leads because as a real estate agent, um, you don't want to like you. You want your website to be to the point, and you just want these people to give you their contact info, and that's basically it. You that's know, you lead. Don't, just go straight. It's to just the lead. Like right. just give me your info, and then let me show you how it works really quickly. So I use a lot of sales funnels. That's been the biggest asset I think with my business instead of a complicated website with paragraphs that no one's gonna read anyways. Um, so I use a lot of sales funnels are very, very short, like landing page websites. And I upload a video on there so it tells them in one minute, hey, I'm an apartment locator, this is what I do, it's free, so why the heck would you not become a lead? And, <laughs> and then they become a lead and that's it. And then my systems will text them, email them, hey, we just got your inquiry. You know, so I try to streamline a lot of things. So how do you keep yourself from wasting time People like, you know, people that are just looking around, like, how, how do you follow back up with, like, is it in the sales funnel or, like, how do you keep yourself from, like, just wasting time with people that don't really want to get an apartment right then? Maybe they're yeah. like, just looking down the line for maybe six months from now. Uh -huh. like, I probably got remember that person that you yeah. do every single day, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can do it manually. Like the first two years, I did everything manually. I didn't know about software. So mm -hmm. the you could do it manually. You have something called a guest card where you're supposed to remember to ask these questions. And they're very to the point. And then you can get really targeted on when someone's trying to move in. Because the big thing is, you know, it, apartments all operate on a 60 day notice. So if someone wants to move in within 60 days, cool, because they know their availability for the next 60 days and you can close, you can close them. Right. But if someone's trying to move in three or four months in the future, you probably don't want to waste your time with that person because even the apartments don't know what's available because right. the tenant, they're only putting in 60 day notices. Right, exactly. So that would be a big waste of time. So you can do it manually like I did for the first two years, but when you get more advanced, the answer is software again. So after they hit my sales funnel and become a lead, the second thing I do is I uh, bring them through like a pre-qualification automation and it'll ask them like one question at a time, what the move-in date is, what the income is, and it gets imported into like my, my Google sheet. So like every day when I have my Facebook ads and my Google ad campaigns running, you know, they're funneling these people in a much more efficient way with a simple website which is a sales funnel. So boom, you're a lead, that was easy. And then the second step is they're getting these pre-qual questions. And the ones that don't, what I've noticed is the ones that don't do the pre-qual, they're probably not, you know, they're probably not serious. Right, exactly. But then the ones that do, all right, well now they're in my Google sheet and then I'll take a look and if everything looks good, then you call those leads. Gotcha. And you know, so there's, that's how you kind of save time. So roughly on a normal day, how many phone calls do you think you make? Uh, that's a good, probably 10. 10, you only make 10 probably 10 10 or 12 yeah wow that oh yeah that's it and that's another big thing i yeah. should probably bring up the big thing with locating that uh, I know people don't consider is that w it's 10 or 12, but the reason you, you don't have to take that many is because they're no longer cold calls. Like when someone contacts you and they already know about you because of your sales funnel and like, like they know you're the going to help. You're putting out. It's like, yeah. a yeah, exactly. And the content helps a lot as well. Mm -hmm. um, but when they contact you first, it's no longer a cold call. It's like a warm call. Right. And so warm calls, you can just close at a much better rate than some random person you know and so that's the cool thing with locating things are swapped is what i find a lot with the locating industry like 
you know, when have you heard of a realtor able to work from home? That's not really possible because right. you got the lock boxes and the resale homes right. and like you got to go out there. Right. But with locating, you know, we're posting ads and these people are like, cool, they can help me with an apartment. They contact you first. And so now it's like you don't have to tell them, you know, uh, what the deal is because they know you're going to help them find an apartment. So effectively, it's a warm call and then you can take less calls and close at a better rate. That's so, why I like locating. So, so I know you said you spend about what five, six grand a month on just advertising, right? Uh, yeah, as a as a locator. Yeah, as a locator. I mean, so I mean, what do you what do the profit margins look like for you? Very high, um, very high. So I think my average lead acquisition is like anywhere from maybe six to nine dollars a lead, okay. and yeah, not all leads are going to close every time, of course, but. Um, I find that you can do 20 or 40%, um, you can close 20 or 40% mm -hmm. from, from the leads that you're, that you're bringing in. But it's, it's, I mean, there's so many factors with paid ads. Right. So yeah, we could talk for so long about the, all the little factors, but in a nutshell, what I like to do is, um, and, and how I help people tweak their agents, tweak their paid ads is that whenever I run ads, my text, and then the video that I'm running, like immediately I tell them like, Hey, only click here. If you're looking to move into an apartment within 60 days, or I tell them like, if you're interested in renting an apartment within 60 days, then read this, you know? So I'm telling them kind of upfront, like, if you're not trying to move in within 60 days, I don't, I don't really want to, <laughs> yeah, I don't really want to talk to you. And then that's a, that's such a big, big fake. So that's how you can do 20 or, or 40% conversion rates. Cause if you just run a fantastic state of the art ad, right? It's yeah. a fantastic ad. And it's like, wow, these people can help me find an apartment. A lot of people are going to click and you're not really going to close a lot cause you only have a 60 day window. Right. So you've got to really have a strategy. Gotta filter it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Up front. Cause you don't want people to get curious and click and now you paid for it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I know normally, uh, I know you said you normally do a class buildings. Are C class <laughs> buildings even worth leasing out? Yeah, actually sometimes they are because, uh, uh, what I find is a lot of times C class buildings will be more lenient with like a credit score or, um, maybe they'll take like one misdemeanor that's unique that no one else will. Right. And so when you, it's cool because when you get, um, even problematic client, like clients with not the best, uh, background, right. you know, a lot of the times you can just send them over to the same 10 places that are class C and now it's not really a lot of work for you because, okay, well your credits this low, well then here are your 10 options. And then you just send that over and over and over again. Gotcha. And if they get approved, whether it's a class C or a class A, I mean, the, the money's still green or blue. <laughs> so, yeah. And then another thing I want to talk to you about is, uh, I know you do corporate leases, right? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. So, yeah. I mean, with the corporate leases, how often do you see those come through? I see those come through probably three or four times in a year. Okay, and how, how yeah. big is usually is that package coming through? Uh, what do you mean by the, the package? I mean, like, I know you do normally, when you do a corporate lease, you're doing usually more than one unit, right? Yeah, so, it's, any, it's anywhere from, like, five to, the most I've ever done was 25. At one time? Actually, no, it was, like, 27. 27. 27 at one time. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was at the Core Zone and uh, the Beverly Buildings downtown in Austin. in Austin. Okay. Yeah, and those two, yeah. And, and basically, how did you get that business? Um, so the first one I got... Um, before I ever even knew this was a thing, I had no idea you could blanket lease at, as an apartment locator until I got a random Craigslist phone call. So I, I just had a, you know, cra random free Craigslist ad. It wasn't even from paid Facebook. I was yeah. so surprised, but, um, I had a Craigslist ad and I had a vice president of sales from a short term rental uh, vacation rental client, uh, corporate client. They had like 400 units all around the United States and what they would do. I'm sure you've heard of the model. They would, uh, master lease these apartment buildings and then sublet them like on Airbnb right. and mm -hmm. maximize profits. So that's kind of tough as a company because it's so controversial, that business model. And right. it's hard to get these owners to say yes, because everyone wants to fill up their vacancies and lease 20 units at once, but no right. one wants to upset their current tenants. Right. Cause then there's like, this, what is this like a hotel you know right. mm -hmm. so it's hard to do that and so this vp of sales was was he had a smart idea he's like why don't i just contact i guess he knew about apartment locators right. and he's like why don't i just contact apartment locator to help me do my job for me and so i got a call and yeah and he explained it to me and he's like this is this is the deal it you know it's hard to get a yes but sometimes they say yes you know can you help mm -hmm. 
And and at the time, I had I really didn't know anything about the model. So I said, well, as long as you're willing to like write my name down on every single unit, I might be able to make some calls for you. Right. And so it, I brought this this deal or this opportunity to my broker at first. This is my fir- my second or third year. Um, and I brought this to my broker and I was like, what do you think about this? Is this, and is this worth, worth pursuing? And my broker and the assistant manager told me that it would be a waste of time. Really? And yeah, they told me it would be a waste of time and that no building would be willing to do that. And so I had nothing to do like that afternoon. So I just made some random calls and I was explaining, uh, what I would do, what I did differently is I was, I was contacting class a buildings that were brand new, like they were lease up property. So they had just released a building and they had like no, no tenants. Gotcha. And so, you know, so they pay well because right. you know, cause whatever. They're yeah, new. they're new. And mm-hmm. the, the number one thing you want to do when um, a lot of investors are investing in a brand new building is just freaking fill up vacancies, get that investment back, right. you know? And so I contacted uh, a building and I was like, listen, I've got this really weird situation, but I swear they're legit. It's a big company. They have their own cleaning team, et cetera. I can connect you to the VP of sales and they want to lease 20 of your units. And so that's very attractive for a building that doesn't have a lot of tenants. That's very low vacancy, right? Yeah. And so they said, all right, well, come on in and we'll hear you out. And so that I just had my, my client, the VP of sales, super sharp guy. I had him come for the meeting and they're just so good at closing because they understand their own business. Right. So he just closed out the deal and they just turned to me and said, what do you want for compensation? And I was like, just pay me whatever you pay normal realtors per each unit. And I got it. And that was the first time it ever happened. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, on a deal like that, what does the commission look like? Uh, so it was 20, the first one I did was 14 units. Um, they were paying 150% because they were brand new and they really needed uh, uh, tenants. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the market rents were $2,000. Wow. So 150% of two, because they did two twos. That's the other thing. These companies, they love working with two twos because they can put, you know, more short term rental people maximize the profit. So for me, it was just music to my ear. I was like, well, you want two and three bedrooms? I'm like, well, that's higher. Yeah. Yeah, So um, it was a two 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 thousand dollars. It was in UT campus. Um, The first property that I ever did, it was called Uptown in UT campus in, in Austin. And uh, it was 14 units at $2,000, but 150%. So it's 3,000 times 14 units, whatever that number is. Wow. Yeah, let's, it was. Let's do, let's do some <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had to pay my broker how much? Yeah. $2,000 of that. But that's, that's not a lot of that's money. That's pretty much it, though. That's it, just the 2K. Just 2K. So yeah. we're looking at. I was stoked. I bought a Porsche 911 right after. Yeah, it so was a dumb at, decision. So we're looking at what, three? 3k uh yeah 3000 times 14 units but then subtract 2 grand cuz that was my bro- yeah yeah so you made $40,000 in one deal yeah and no locator lo- no locator has ever done it so I, they the were tell- one. Mm-hmm. they were telling me they were like no one has ever done this we don't even know what this business model is it was it was back when like airbnb companies were just surfacing yeah cuz this was what year was this what year what i think this was like 2016 2016 i think Okay. Uh huh. Twenty sixteen. No, twenty seventeen as well. Yep, I did it both years. Right. Okay. And then, so tell me exactly. Um, pretty much when you when you did that, I mean, you, did you try to focus more on corporate leases? Or? I did. Yeah. Because yeah. after that, I was like, this is just crazy. This yeah. is one deal. Um, so I, I really try to do that. I had a separate section on my sales funnel that was like, are you a corporate company needing like, you know, units? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, yeah. So I had, I had that separate section on my website or my sales funnel. Um, and I just did, you know, just standard marketing on free organic platforms like Craigslist, Facebook. And then I would, I would try to do paid ad campaigns, but the paid ads didn't work well because it was so niche is what I realized. Right. Yeah, so I spent like a couple thousand just wasted because, you know, I was all excited right. and I was like, I'm going to target these companies, but there just wasn't really many of them hanging out on oh, Facebook. Exactly. So I, I wasted a couple thousand dollars on Facebook, quickly turned that off. Um, but just, just through organic posts, just like Craigslist and, and other avenues. And then the, what's, what was interesting is I had, a, I had a referral for a corporate company, um, from some downtown property that I never even worked with, but the, it's funny, the property managers in these apartment buildings, they talk, 
like yeah. they're social, like the property mm -hmm. managers. And so someone told them that like I had brought them this crazy like 20 units and helped them like blanket lease. And so they they referred this other corporation that was looking to do it to me. Right. And so it, it, I came through a referral and that was really cool. Um, so uh -huh. a, yeah, a couple just through referrals, like uh, Pierre will help you. And um, a lot of it just from free postings, which okay. sounds absurd because it's like one of the highest payout clients and you don't have to run paid ads exactly. for it. It's, yeah, it's just crazy. like so, swapped. So also as well, yeah. with the property manager of these buildings, did you ever make a chance? I know you don't normally do escorts. I hear you say that all the time. Did you go and meet these property managers and build relationships with them? Or how do you really yeah. drum up that drum? I mean, keep that relationship tight like that, you know? Yeah, so I, I um, on the first blanket deal, I definitely escorted. I am kind of picky on <laughs> that. I, I was, like, I was like, for forty grand, I'll, I'll drive up, you yeah. know. <laughs> so I was like, I gotta go, I gotta go escort. So I was there with them for the first meeting, okay. um, and and it worked well. And when they closed that unit, they were very thankful too, because. Yeah. I mean, cause then, you know, you're helping the property manager do her job. Like I just leased 20 units and now their bosses are all happy that they're right. filling up occupancy. But, um, I took some of that commission and I gave all the staff in every building like $150 visa gift cards, wow. okay. you know, cause what I can, I just made 40 grand. So I just gave everyone 150 bucks and they were like, what? Yeah, and that helped a lot. This is the, the little things I think, um, where if people see you making an effort in person, it helps, you know, and it doesn't have to be a large amount of money. Um, but that's what I did for them. And I said, thank you so much for like the, the consideration. Okay. Um, yeah. So that helped. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and I, I mean, up here with the courses, what made you really start teaching people? Yeah. After like five, uh, after six years doing it, um, what I noticed is that, um, I thought about this for a while and when I was doing my pre-licensing, um, courses, there was zero language zero. with a part. Oh yeah. Cause you've, you've done it, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah there, no one talks about apartment locating. I was like, how are you? No one's talking about this and I've made so much money, you know? Exactly. And so that was like, okay, interesting. Like even they're not teaching it. And then, so I, what I did is I did a Google search. I'm like, I wonder who's like talking about apartment locating. Nobody. So I went on YouTube, no one was talking about it. Yeah. And I'm like, well, is this, is this cool? Like, can I be the first one? Like I've actually, after these, these big deals that I've done, it gave me the confidence to feel like I, I know this business, like I can actually help people. I'm, you know what I mean? Like I've, I've actually done it. Um, so I was, I was interested in, in seeing if I could teach it just because honestly it was boring just be, being a real estate agent for years. And I wanted to try something different. Um, so I was like, maybe I can just, um, and that's the only thing I knew like at an expert level. So I was like, well, I can teach this apartment locating niche cause I know about it. Um, and I didn't go to college. Right. So. Mm -hmm. It's not like I had extensive experience with much other, uh, you know, much, much else. Um, so I, I went online, no one was talking about it. And I was like, this seems like a good opportunity. And when I, when I digged further and I started looking up like, you know, like the keyword traffic, like we talked about, that was discouraging. Um, I feel like a lot of YouTubers try to start YouTube for the big views right. and, you know, and so I knew that was, would never happen since no one was looking up apartment locating. Right, exactly. So I was like, man, I'm about to make a bunch of content and get like, like one view, you know, because right. <laughs> no one was looking it up. But I thought to myself, like, this is the only real thing that I'm an expert in. And so I was like, screw it. I'm just going to start do it anyways, even even though I know there's not a lot of like Google traffic to it. So I started putting out content and people started listening. I was actually quite shocked. Um, so people started listening and they were like, wow, this is actually really interesting. And okay. they started reaching out to me. Um, and that's when um, I, I did the content before I, I did my coaching program. Okay, gotcha. And so I was giving out content and, and these people were like, where can I learn more? And so that, that kind of um, helped me understand that there was a need in the market to teach this stuff. And do you feel yeah. like, um, as far as what you do with the courses, do you feel like you ever stop apartment locating and just typically teach? Or no, like what's the, what's the end game for you, Pierre? Like, I mean, you made a bunch of money. You're teaching all these people now how to make money. Your students are making money. What's the end game for you? I would like, um, I see a big problem with brokerage firms for apartment locating. The realtors got it down, like Keller Williams, they got it down. Right. But um, for apartment locating, it's such an incredible niche where you can come in like me with no college degree. I was a freaking bus boy and a bank teller, and I made six figures my first year. and. Um, that's incredible. Right. And so I, I feel like it needed to be taught and no one was doing it. So what is the end game? Um, I'm not going to stop locating because it's just so quick turnaround and like, 
I get friends of friends that are like, can you help me find an apartment? It takes me five minutes to send them over a list. Right. So I'm not going to just stop doing that. That wouldn't right. make it, that wouldn't make any sense if I stopped. Um, but the end game is that I see a big problem with brokerage firms for apartment locating, not really offering a lot of support. Like no one's teaching digital marketing and that's what changed my entire career and no one's teaching digital marketing. Um, and there, there's a there's a lack of support with um, collections. So the collections department yeah. is probably the number one like controversial topic within the whole niche of locating. Mm -hmm. Is you know it's easy to get people to write your name on a rental application right. and get paid, but but building a relationship with a building and following up and making sure you're collecting your commission on time takes effort, and a lot of brokers don't even offer that. Like they put it on the agent, like on you or me to go, to, to, to go collect. And well, I feel like it's it so be the, it should be the broker doing that. Yeah, because yeah. you're, you're splitting commissions with them. So yeah. it's like, wait, you're taking my money and you're not. What are you doing for me? Right, exactly. You know, and so I see that a lot with um, the locating industry. You know, and it's like it's and a lot of the the big arguments like, oh, well, we give you leads, and I'm like, well, this is like the easiest business to get leads. You just post some Craigslist ads, and you <laughs> right. jump on Facebook Marketplace, and like yeah. when you're good at it, you run paid Facebook ads. So it's like, yeah, because that's that's what I feel like <laughs> the, the big firms do. Because I have a friend that works for one of the big firms. Yeah, and he said he only get I think it take the brokers take sixty seven percent. That's retarded. That's crazy. I would never do that. Sixty seven percent. Just for giving you leads, I'm like they have an Instagram page. People just DM them and they just give it to you. I hate that. You know what I, yeah. I mean? But I guess to learn the business, I guess it was a smart thing to do. But I mean, you could just do it on your own because I mean, you can build a social media presence and then honestly just post your own ads and then just keep all the money. I, I mean, <laughs> you know? the, yeah, that's what it comes. That's what it comes down to. I mean, you do have to be a broker to get the, the checks directly to you, but right. but there are brokers where you can. Um, I mean, you can work for a flat fee broker. Yeah, yeah, like you could do that as well. Yeah. And that's the big like to me. It's a big scam, right? Like taking sixty seven percent of your income, you still got to pay taxes too. So you're basically an employee at yeah, that point. Yeah. You know, like on my forty thousand dollar blanket deal my broker took two grand because right. I'm with a, a smaller broker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, if I paid 67% of that, that would just, that would be ridiculous. And do you feel like you have a hard, <laughs> you feel like you had to have a hard time with your broker, get them to really start collecting for you? Yeah. And like you had to bounce off from different, bro different brokers until exactly. you found That's the, right the biggest one. thing. Everyone does that in the industry. Like the, the top producers that know the game and mm -hmm. they know it's not that hard. They always bounce around because they're trying to get support. Because the thing is, if you're a good top producer, that doesn't necessarily mean you're a good collections agent because right, exactly. that's a freaking admin task. Mm -hmm. It's like we're real estate agents. We want to close rentals or close homes. We just want to close and connect with clients. Exactly. We don't have to worry about... Um, you know, collections, right? <laughs> like, like we're a receptionist or an would, admin. Would you feel like it's more advantageous to work with a flat fee brokerage firm and they just hire an admin person to do that for you, or just actually work with just try to try to build a relationship with a broker that's actually good at collections? Yeah, I mean, in theory, like if you just thought about it with no experience, well, yeah, you would get a flat fee brokerage firm and you would hire some VA from the Philippines and right. do your thing. I mean, everyone that's the that's the knowledge, but being in the industry and knowing that like things are actually harder than what it just sounds like is a good idea. I would actually not <laughs> recommend that. Um, unless you're an expert with running your marketing and you're making tons of money, mm -hmm. because training a collection staff um, I feel like you can't really do overseas. You really want to hire someone like in your city right. from America because it, it, it's a lot about the relationship. It's a very social, gossipy business real estate. I've I've noticed over my seven year career, everyone talks to one another. Everyone, it like you have to be professional, make an effort to be kind. So training collection staff um, could be kind of complicated. You want to you want to pay them well because if you give them an incentive to collect quicker, you're just gonna get your money faster gotcha. so you know training employees and hiring them that's not e i mean it sounds easy like oh yeah. the answer is to do this but when you really do it it's it's a lot harder especially when you're first starting off and you're trying to get a grasp of the industry so i do not recommend cheap flat free brokerage firms mm -hmm. and trying to do collections yourself because you're gonna get a bad. It's gonna put a bad taste of the industry in your in your mind, right? You're only gonna close a few deals because you're brand new. You're gonna spend all your time collecting on them, and finally, when you get them, you're gonna go. This isn't even worth it. I spent all this.
this time yeah, to collect two thousand dollars this month? Like, right. what is this? And so it's <laughs> right. going to make. And a lot of people give up on the industry that way. Mm -hmm. So I think the smartest thing to do is work with. Um, a broker that's reasonable to you. I mean, we're all going to have different definition of, of what's reasonable, but I mean, for me, I'm not paying more than two thousand, a thousand or two thousand dollars for a broker to do my collections. Right. So, I mean, percent I mean, wise, <laughs> with that, I mean, what, I mean, what's your split right now? Uh, well, I do things a little differently. Like I have a separate LLC where I, I have an option to run things through that. It gets very taxi and legally weird. Mm -hmm. But um, before, when I was just like a personal agent, personal license, it was held by a local small broker um, in Austin. Mm -hmm. And I built a really nice relationship with her as well. She's an older lady, has been doing locating for the longest time doesn't really know a lot about digital marketing, but I can trust her yeah. and she didn't take a lot of um, the commission. So that I was, I was there for the majority of, of the seven years as okay. well. Gotcha. Yeah. And so I would just recommend doing that. Go to a small broker, someone you can really trust because the, the truth is no one, and I know my industry. So like no one really knows digital marketing. They just don't, you know, and I, I tell my students, like, ask them, like, ask them what a sales funnel is, ask them what a targeted paid Facebook ad is, what remarketing is, what a pixel is. And they're like, oh, you're right. They don't know what any of that stuff is. So in our small industry, a lot of people don't know digital marketing and that's how you market in the best way. So if they're not going to teach you all that advanced stuff, you might as well just go to a broker that you can trust that is taking a reasonable split from you. Um, and that will give you some leads to piggyback off of for free. Mm -hmm. So at least you're doing some work. You're okay. not just doing nothing every day. And then, th and hopefully they have a collections department for you. So would you say about 15% split is too much for a broker? Uh, how much? 15%. I think that's good. I mean, I think I think if you trust them, because um, there's a lot of uh, there's there's I've heard of some stories where um, like the brokers will do something called like they'll collect your commission, which takes a month already. And then they'll do like in-house holding and they'll release it back to you in a couple weeks. Mm. And that's crazy to me. It sounds like an interest-free loan yeah, that I mean, you know. Really <laughs> like that, yeah. yeah. So I've seen some. I've been around, obviously. Yeah. So I've seen some brokers pull that as well. So I don't like any in-house. Like we're gonna hold your check for a couple more weeks and then release it to you because it's right. like I'm just giving you an interest-free loan. Yeah. Um, so you know, you get with a broker that you can trust um, that will give you some free leads and that has a decent collections department, at least a system of like. It, all right, it's clearly working, you know? And then how often so. would you say like your broker probably calls to collect on a, on a payment for you? Like, oh the, yeah. Uh, so I do all that stuff myself now, but, um, b before, cause the majority of my career was, I was obviously a personal it's solo agent. Sure. Um, it, they had a good system and they only had two staff, mm -hmm. but the staff were very friendly and my broker was smart. She would hire collections people with like, there were always women and they had like these like really friendly voices over the phone. Like sure. you couldn't get mad at them. And that's what you want with your collections department. You know, someone to call in and they're so nice. It's like hard to even be mad at them because then you collect faster, but they had two collections agents and they were following up once, once every seven to 14 days. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and some people think it's redundant. Like a lot of uh, my followers are like, why would you follow up every single week when you know it's going to take 30 days before they even cut you the check? Right. So like the logic makes sense, but the reason you want to follow up every single week is because a lot of the times in big, big markets, um, the management company might change their account uh, payable departments. Like the email might change. They I might see, switch. I see, I see Did you that. see that? I see that in the, um, on the, on the, um, what is it? Smart data app. I see that. Yeah. See that all the time. And, yeah. and the agent knows. Yeah. They're like, no, this email doesn't work anymore. You got to send it to this. <laughs> so do, 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 like, do you think property management companies do that on purpose so they don't have to pay locators? No, I don't think it's that crazy. No. You know, it's that, yeah. You think it's like some kind of conspiracy with that? Okay. No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, honestly, if you're going to have a poor experience, it, it might be with like, like a class C, like, a uh, tiny management company, maybe privately owned. Right. I could maybe, you know, but these big management companies like Roscoe, Lincoln, Graystar, exactly. Pinnacle, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they understand the value that locators bring. And we do add a lot of value because instead of them like running a, a paid marketing campaign and hoping they get tenants and that the, the hoping the filters were set up right, we just bring them the tenant. 
and then they only pay us after they pay rent once so it's like right. not it's always profitable to them and they stay liquid right. you know so a lot of a lot of big management companies that are successful um will recognize the value of a locator and i just doubt that happens um i, I only had one bad experience in my seven-year career with like clearly someone trying to cut me out of my commission and it was a class c private <laughs> privately managed little rinky dink apartment right like it is like after that happens you just don't send them back over there anymore basically you just don't send yeah them yeah like you fight for it you're like no here are the this is the writing like and then you get your check and you just don't work with that little class c rinky dink yeah. property anymore yeah, okay. You know, that you just so, don't. <laughs> so you try to stay around like the big management companies like Lincoln, Graystar, Roscoe. Like, I like to. Yeah, yeah, you try to stay around those. Okay. I like to, yeah. And that's not that every private managed company is bad or anything, or, or even if it's Class C. I've met some really, really awesome um, friends and leasing agents that worked at Class C properties. So it's nothing about that, but. I mean, the honest truth is the one time that it was clear that they were trying to come out of my check, it was a class C rinky dink property. Like, right. That's just, that's not an opinion. That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> then I, I know Pierre, I know you said, um, you know, your end game is to eventually get that, you know, start that hundred brokerage firm. Agent, oh yeah. Name. At least a hundred. Yeah. yeah. So you would For just me to jump, consider jump it. off with a hundred off top. Just like at least. At least. Yeah. yeah, maybe I was thinking maybe 200 or 250, but that's the thing you can do that with if you put out content and these people mm -hmm. trust you and, and you know, you're valuing putting out content. I feel like it's possible and it works for the agents, too, because if I started a brokerage firm right now with 10 agents, OK, I could do that. I could afford that. OK, mm -hmm. but it's it's I have to support them well I have to be available for them now I have to hire staff for collections mm -hmm. and by the time I set up a collections department uh, marketing campaigns for now 12 additional agents not just myself and all of this stuff I'm barely making a profit and so I can't make things better for agents if so, they want you know what I mean right so do you think it's a certain dollar amount you have to hit probably to start a brokerage front what, what do you think is the number yeah I mean if you're doing um let's see here like for 100 agents how much you think liquid capital you think you would need oh liquid capital um it's really not it's really not a lot for for uh i'm thinking long term month by month campaigns um i mean liquid I mean, you can do it with 20 20 grand it's 20 grand you could have 100 agents uh for oh no not for 100 i'm sorry for that was like for like 10 agents oh like for 10 agents yeah, yeah you could do it for 20 grand but are you going to survive month by month yeah, probably, probably not, not. yeah <laughs> that's the whole thing you know um so um yeah for like 100 or 200 agents um i would say you would need to be at like a hundred thousand dollar months to, um, to survive. I th yeah, I think I think that no, well, to thrive. Yeah, because okay. I like to start things like when you're gonna thrive, because it's good for your agents. You've got plenty of resources for support. Mm -hmm. Like your ad campaigns are actually firing and working. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't work so well, you're still good. You know, so I, I think it works better for agents um, and the broker to start when with lower risk, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to get 10 or 20 agents onto your firm. Now they transfer their license over and you did it barely with the cash you had. And now you go out of business and then now 20 people are out of their out of their their job. They have to right. go inactive or go somewhere else. Right. You know, so it's really doing a justice, I feel like, to the agents to wait until you're there, like right. co comfortably. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do. And some people disagree, but I feel like the path is to make good content, actually help people first, um, and then and then just grow your resources on a monthly basis the way I do with my coaching program. Um, and then when I'm when you're very ready and able to, you know, I'm going to come in, hire the best collections because I know the thing's wrong. So I'm going to hire the best collections department for everybody. Um, I'm going to have tested already running campaigns for leads. So no one's just out of leads. Um, and I'm going to do that well. And then I'll open the, bro the, broker's, the broker, firm. the broker's firm. But that would be my end game. What, I think that'd be cool. What do you expect to do that? Um, hopefully in a year. <laughs> if everything goes well wow. yeah hopefully in a year might be you know how that goes though we say a year is two years you know okay so a year or two yeah I, that's my goal I, ho I hope to do it in a year or two i yeah. hope so and i should if i do everything right yeah then so duck hunting uh say again duck hunting duck hunting, duck hunting. <laughs> uh, honestly i came up maybe if uh, i'll let i'll let my audience pick what the name is going to be right. yeah 
Um, but yeah, I just came up with that name on a whim. I was like, I was like, what the heck should I call this YouTube? The YouTube first was a real estate duck hunters, yeah. you know, cause I call it dollar bills, bucks, ducks. Oh. <laughs> I was, that, that's right. I was like, let's hunt some ducks. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. And, uh, but then I, ch I changed the channel to apartment locating on YouTube yeah. just cause it made more, it made exactly, more sense. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it took me a while to do that. Okay. Um, it's funny. Like I still see like the, the people in our group, you're in, you're in our group, right? Group, yeah. Heck yeah. So yeah, I see, I see people like they're still referring to themselves as duck hunters. I love it. Every I'm like, time I'm like, yeah, it's a real estate duck hunters. Yeah. I got you. So that's, that's the awesome. for you, Pierre. So a year or two, you shot the brokerage firm. Yeah. If I do everything right, I don't get lazy. I continue to optimize my PPC campaigns well. Um, and I, sh I should have in a, in a year or two, I should have the resources in order to open up a brokerage firm with at least a hundred agents. If not, I've done something wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And over the, yeah. and this, you know, this is the last question I'm asking you here, but over the course of these past seven years, you went through ups and downs, man. You've done a lot of business, wrote a lot of leases. Yeah. Several. I mean, what would you, I mean, what would you say ballpark you think you've made in your real estate career? Oh, uh, out of the whole, the whole seven career, the whole seven career. Interesting. Um, let me pull out this calculator. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Over seven years. That's going to be a big lump sum as well. All right. First year I did like 114. Second year is like 127. Um, and then it must have just gone up from there. So then 5246 plus. I probably did just over a million but spread out so just over a million. so yes yeah. would you say net profit oh oh no net on my tax return net yeah <laughs> yeah but that's not that impressive yeah, that's, you consistently, divide that by seven well, you've consistently <laughs> done six figures yeah I mean, probably since you've been doing this yeah of course net gotcha. okay. yeah net definitely net um okay. yeah which is really not that let's see here Average. Yeah, so that my average is like maybe one sixty eight over the spread out. I mean, not um, as a solo agent, that's not but my business. That's just like as a locate as right, a locator. As a locator. Yeah, as, locator. yeah. And what? And what? How many deals do you say you close a month? Uh, uh, if I, if I do it third my full thirty hour weeks, that's another thing. I've never worked more than thirty hour weeks ever. So never. never. Okay. Like the first two weeks, I did forty hours, and then it, it was just working so well. I never worked more than thirty hour weeks ever in seven years yeah. um and so uh uh well your question i'm sorry what was your question it just it flew out of my head yeah so <laughs> no, the question was uh with just this right i know you said um uh, how many at least do you do per month oh okay yeah so if i do do 30 hours a week and i'm yeah. trying well, that's me trying really hard i'll do anywhere from like 25 to 30. Okay. currently i just i can't do 30 hours um every single week with locating because i'm so busy with Doing like content. Doing content like, and just trying to do youtube right and all stay active in the facebook group answer everybody's questions exactly yeah. so i'll do like 12 to 18 maybe on a good month okay 12 to 18. okay so take a dip like so half so the, yeah so facebook group can thrive and all of that yeah okay sometimes less than half but gotcha. yeah okay I mean, yeah. well that's my last question pierre man it was great having you no i uh, thank you so much i really appreciate this it very informative man. I think oh was it really i hope it was oh yeah man. i think everybody's gonna get a bunch of insight in this man. nice like i mean you knew everything i probably thought you were gonna know about the business man and just you know you seem to be going on a really right path thank you you're gonna open up the brokerage firm i think you'll have a lot of success with your agents because you seem to understand like you know you're not too far removed from being an agent versus being a broker so yeah. i think you'll be able to you know coincide with your agents very well and you know grow your business you know thank you thank yeah. you very much well than that man we're good man so thanks for me thanks for coming on raw discord <laughs> yeah, I, you want to grab a drink oh yeah let's, let's go let's grab a drink after it. this hey, man. Thanks for <laughs> on the show, man and uh i guess i'll see you another year or two Pierre. awesome thank thanks you so lot, much man. yep